everyone and welcome to edu search clinics i am dr gunjan desai and today we will continue our discussion on inflammatory bowel disease and we are going to focus on some very specific areas when you are trying to understand ibd or you are trying to see these patients clinically so we have already seen this spectrum of inflammatory bowel disorders in the previous video and we have seen the natural history of disease. I have explained these phases. And what we are going to start from today is phase one. That is detection and diagnosis of disease based on clinical presentation. Okay, so you can have active disease or the patient can present itself with complicated disease. And we are going to see how the diagnosis of IBD is made to reach phase two where we have initiation of treatment. So when we talk of inflammatory bowel disease diagnosis, there are four key pillars on which this entire topic stands. One is clinical features and understand that there are a lot of differential diagnoses of IBD and clinical features do point in a direction towards IBD or away from IBD. After clinical features, you have to look at the laboratory investigations. There are some investigations that help in understanding whether the patient has IBD or not. Then there is imaging, endoscopy, and biopsy. All these points need to be seen together to understand if the patient has IBD or not. Okay, So we are going to see them one by one across a series of videos. But towards the end, while we are summarizing phase one, we will have one video where we will keep for each differential diagnosis, these four points together so that you can understand how things differ and how you can reach a diagnosis. So in clinical pulse for IBD and related disease, whenever you see these patients in history, the patients can have bleeding or mucus per rectum, pain during defecation. Always remember KFC for stool, that is color, consistency, frequency, Okay, and look at tenesmus, colic, also have a look at anorexia, weight loss, fever, and extra intestinal manifestations. Okay, so all these points are important to understand in history. So all these points help in understanding whether the patient has a colonic pathology or a small bowel pathology. Anorexia, weight loss help in ruling out malignancy as well as chronic disease such as tuberculosis or IBD. But when you see all these points, understand that you are dealing with a case of colorectal or low intestinal pathology. Coming to past personal and family history, important points are similar history in the past. Drug history is important and you will see that drug-induced colitis is also a differential diagnosis of IBD. Metabolic syndrome, okay, that is also important because ischemic colitis is, is com more common in patients with metabolic syndrome with thrombotic states. Dietary habits are important to understand. Addictions, recreational drug use, travel, all these histories are important. Travel and addictions to understand if the patient can have immunocompromise and the patient can have infective colitis. In examination, look for lump, more common in malignancy and cox. Tenderness, per rectal exam is most important and there are a separate video entirely if we want to discuss per rectal exam and look for extra intestinal manifestations. So if you see all these points in your case, they, there is a high likelihood that you will have some inclination towards a diagnosis. So now going to clinical features of ulcerative colitis, it is more common in whites and Jewish population. Non-smokers are also at risk in ulcerative colitis. Patients do have positive family history. Okay. In symptoms, bleeding per rectum is most common seen in 90 to 95% of cases. Abdominal pain is seen in 65% of cases. And tenismus is also there. Okay. Patients can also have mucus per rectum and diarrhea. The presentation will vary with severity and extent of disease. Like we said, phase 1 can have active colitis or complicated colitis. So if the patient presents with toxic megacolon and severe sepsis, then that is acute severe disease. 
or the patient can have long duration of loose stools and mucus with weight loss. Unknown origin pain in abdomen and pelvis. Again, think of ulcerative colitis as a differential diagnosis. Sometimes infective etiology and colitis is present which prompts investigations. And on investigations, you identify that the patient has ulcerative colitis. So these are cases of asymptomatic presentation of ulcerative colitis, right? Multiple ways in which it can present clinically, it can be an asymptomatic presentation with another etiology such as infective colitis leading to investigations. It can be a long-standing abdominal or pelvic pain of unknown origin. It can be chronic classical presentation or it can be acute severe disease. Now going to Crohn's disease, abdominal pain is the most common in 80 to 85 percent of cases and weight loss is seen in 60 percent of cases. So in ulcerative colitis, bleeding per rectum is the most common feature. In Crohn's disease, abdominal pain is the most common feature. Chronic diarrhea with mucus and blood is less common in Crohn's disease and it's seen only in 40 to 50 percent of cases. Small bowel predominant disease, mucus per rectum and tinnitus muscle are less common than ulcerative colitis. In perianal predominant disease, the patient can present with atypical or refractory perianal abscess, complex fistulas or fissures and ulcers. So, rarely Crohn's disease can also present with upper gastrointestinal tract disease and these cases will present with severe epigastric pain nausea, vomiting or simply dyspepsia. So as we all know, Crohn's disease can affect any part of the gastrointestinal tract and that is why all these presentations are important to understand. Now coming to extraintestinal manifestations, there are many extraintestinal manifestations in inflammatory bowel disease. At least 25 to 35 percent of patients will have one extraintestinal manifestation and this can be present before diagnosis of IBD or simultaneous with the diagnosis or after the diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease. And a triad of joint involvement, eye involvement and skin involvement is the most common. So that is the most common triad of extraintestinal manifestation of inflammatory bowel disease. Just to name a few of the common ones, like I said, joint, eye and skin are very common. So arthritis, ankylosing, spondylitis and sacroiliitis in joint, uveitis, scleritis, episcleritis in the eyes and after stomatitis is very common, erythema nodosum and pyoderma gangrenosum. These are very common with IBD. When we see abdominal extraintestinal manifestations, primary sclerosing cholangitis is quite common, which can lead to biliary cirrhosis. So, all these features are common. We will have a separate presentation on extraintestinal manifestations. But the point to highlight here is that you should know that the patient can present with extraintestinal manifestations as the first presentation of IBD. And nearly one in three of these patients have at least one extraintestinal manifestation. So when we come to differentials based on clinical history and examination, there is a long list. But these are some of the common differentials that we are going to highlight in this entire series because these are the most commonly seen differentials which can mimic inflammatory bowel disease such as infective colitis, pseudomembranous colitis, ischemic enteritis and colitis, radiation enteritis and colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, colorectal cancer of course is a differential but it is also a part of natural history of ulcerative colitis, intestinal tuberculosis, chronic non-specific ulcers of small intestine or CNSU, Cryptogenic multifocal ulcerous stenosing enteritis or CMUSE. These two are also very common these days where patients present with ulcers in the small intestine. Eosinophilic gastritis, gastroenteritis and intestinal basset disease. So we will see clinical features and how they can help us in differentiating these conditions for IBD in the next part of this video. And in that part, we will complete the one pillar of IBD diagnosis that is clinical features and differentials. Thank you.